This week on the Movement RVA podcast, we talked about how not to be an imposter and why half naked girls on Instagram might not be such a good idea. We have formed a super tribe with Koyos. What is Koyos? Koyos is a nootropic that enhances cognitive function. That means if you use your brain to make money or you use your brain in general, Koyos will help you use it more effectively. I use Koyos, Jake uses Koyos, lots of people at CrossFit RVA use Koyos. And we now have a uh, sponsorship with them where you get 25% off if you use the code RVA when you go to purchase at their website. That is RVA. So go to www.mentaltitan.com, purchase your Koyos today, Use our code, get 25% off. I don't like doing this that much, but if you like the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you think we're really awesome, go to iTunes, give us a review. Five stars is the best we can get. We're honestly happy with anything that happens. So do it, do it now, and enjoy the show. Welcome back, everybody. Episode Welcome tw- back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. I want to fucking write a theme song. Was there a tune to what you just did? Yeah, it was. Um, what song is it? Uh, I had it in my head. Should I sing it again? Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. I feel like there's going to be some somebody with... Pe- Perfect pitches. Yes. Just gonna say that's that's the same note every time. Every time. Name like it's that a, tune. It's the song. What's it? Deo. I I want to do welcome back actually to the to the tune of Deo. Is it Deo? Yeah, it's Deo. What does that mean? I don't know. Are you looking it up right now? Remember when we thought the um, my Sharona was I Sharona? I actually, until this moment, thought it was I Sharona still. No, we we talked about that. Oh, I forgot that conversation. It was like 10 years ago. Yeah. Hey, welcome back. You said it to Cliff's brother. And he corrected me. He corrected you. Episode 20 of the Movement RVA podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, you might notice that there's just pictures flashing, which um, is a little thing we're trying to do that we probably won't do next week. But never fear. We're still here. And every time we have something cool... There would definitely be a camera there. If you listen to iTunes, give us a review. Or maybe not. Do what you want. We're cool with it all. And uh, anything else they should do, Jake? They should go to my gym and train there. Go to Cross RBA if you're coming through Richmond or you live in Richmond and train there. You should relocate appropriately. Yeah. Your whole life. We're accepting applications from games level athletes. Yeah. Everyone can train for free. If, uh, if you're the best in the world. He said it. He said it, folks. You just have to be the best. You just have to be the best. The best is not... You're talking like Rich Froning comes in trains? No, I'm just lying the whole time. He's right got now. some things going on, Jake. Let's not go down this road. That's fine. Um, I got a question. I don't even, I don't even know what it's going to be. What is imposter syndrome? Oh, God. I'm asking you this because I really don't know. The only reason I know is because I've saw, seen two blogs about it recently. Can you give me like a definition or a background on this? I probably have to Google it, but I'm going to make up a definition first, and then I'll Google it later. That's what we do. That's uh, that's how you become an internet guru, is you make things up first, fact check later. Are you an imposter if you do that? It is, no. No, you are an imposter, but that is not imposter syndrome. Okay. Imposter syndrome is where... You, uh, I think, have a certain amount of uh, self-doubt um, in regards to your own abilities. Um, so it's saying that no matter what, in terms of, I guess, teaching other people or being an expert, that you are never good enough and that uh, everyone else around you, for some reason, knows more. Why does the word imposter come into this? It's because you feel that you're an imposter. Okay. What? That you're a phony, a fraud. And it's obviously bad to have imposter syndrome? What is the opposite uh, choice? 
Or what's the other choice? I think they're saying that is, uh, okay. I mean, if you, uh, let's say you knew the cure to cancer. Okay. Right. I feel like it'd be your duty. All right. No matter what to tell the whole world about your cure to cancer. Absolutely. And, uh, so it's saying that, uh, if you had imposter syndrome, you'd be like, you know what? Someone else probably has a better cure to cancer. I don't, um, I don't think I know enough about this cancer stuff. Okay. I'm not going to tell anybody about it. So in less stark terms, what is what does it mean? Because wh- I'm taking it to the limit. No. 100%. But it's good. That's a good way to like start thinking about things. The most extreme example. I would what say are they maybe talking about? it uh I mean, I saw uh Colm O'Reilly had a blog about it. Who the hell is that? God, I feel like it's like a blast from the past like old school CrossFit guy. Okay, I like him already. Look it up on your uh look it up on your your phone internet. My phone is behind you. Hold on. We'll get it later. We're keeping it very casual today. So. Hold on. But let me, so there's no dead air. Let me, let me think about this out loud for a minute. All the dead air. Just keep it going. The opposite to me is the actual imposter, which I feel like there's way more imposters than there is imposter syndrome. There's plenty of imposters out there. So who is, is it the imposters calling out those with imposter syndrome? You know what's funny? All right, so I'm not going to find it because he's just some some CrossFit guy, I think. I don't even remember anymore. Okay. Um, but he's like a, a thinker or a blogger in the CrossFit Some community. blogger, yeah. Okay. Um, so well, I, I think what uh, in what I've seen lately, it's like, say, a coach, an instructor yeah, who um, does not feel maybe that they're qualified to teach people at a certain level. All right, so it's saying, um, let's say you're the best, uh, you're the best coach in the world, but like old Rich Froning comes in and you're like, you know what, I clearly have nothing to offer this guy. Right. Um, what maybe you do, or maybe uh, I feel like a lot of. What about the jerk that feels like he has a lot to offer Rich Froning, which is just not true. I have some. I have something to say about that. Okay. Um, there's a different syndrome that I don't know the name of, but we'll look it up. We're later. gonna make it up here. Um, so I think a lot of that has to do with how the internet disperses information and how everyone is only going to put their best face forward. Um, and that you really don't get to see people on a day to day basis. And so what I'm saying is, uh, you know, uh, let's say all the best games athletes are, you know, tagging their coach or watching, you know, who's coaching them. Right. And you see how good they're doing. You see their best lifts. You see their best performances. Um, you don't see them training day in, day out. You just see them at their best. Right. Um, and so I think you have to, you know, I think it's easy to make the conclusion that, well, this person, um, clearly is, uh, their coach is, has some, some level of knowledge and ability that's just like out of this world, um, unimaginable to the mere mortal. Um, but, you know, in the grand scheme of things, and I guess from what I've seen is that, uh, I mean, even being around like the very best instructors, um, I feel like I've been around some good ones. Is it like uh, very good, still fallible, still have things I might disagree with. Um, and that what makes them good isn't just some like ridiculous level of knowledge, but it's just like the day in, day out attention to detail and uh, just just the small things, you know. So, so you're saying they're people, a. They're they're people. And b, I feel like a really good coach is also a really good therapist in a lot of ways. Yes. Okay. Um, and they possess those along with a a base of knowledge, wide base of knowledge. They possess those abilities. Yeah, and they're they're able to apply it well. But it's not like uh, anything crazy. They um, they're not a miracle worker. Yeah, and it's not just a I think ability, but also um, you know the imposter syndrome has to do with uh, I guess I get expertise or level of knowledge and, and still um you know if you're arguing with someone on the internet right which i don't really do no one should do this i do like once a year just because it's fun but um you know and if someone's coming at you with some argument right if this is not something that they just uh pulled out of thin air all right who knows where they got that shit from yeah like they were probably like going back and like uh plagiarizing a few lines from super training 99 percent of them are just repeating something they heard they just like googled whatever you said (laughs) and then said the opposite control c control v enter yeah and um so again i I think it's just a way that we sort of our relationship with knowledge 
because of the internet and because of access to information, it just makes it look like people know way more than they do. And so you may feel that you are not qualified to add your own knowledge to the pot. So the guy with imposter syndrome has uh, a confidence issue? Guy or girl? BT dubs on that. It just, I don't know. I mean, it just depends on how you look at it, though. Um, I think it is uh, perfectly okay to have a healthy um, dose of humility and to only really uh, try to apply your knowledge. I mean, not, I guess when you, when it's appropriate and when you have something to add. I mean, I guess it's one thing, I don't know. I think mostly you should shut your mouth on the internet. But, um, you know, day to day, though, um, you know, it's just telling people, like, being okay to tell the people that you work with as an instructor, like, when you don't know something. And then, but when you do know something, like, uh, applying it to the best of your ability. So, uh, what were the, the bloggers, what, what, they defined po- imposter syndrome. They introduced it. By the way, I think it's funny that you said you shouldn't run your mouth on the internet when that's exactly what we're doing right now. I'm an imposter. It's like meta. We're like meta imposters. It's very, this is very postmodern of us. Yeah. Um, what are the bloggers saying about imposter syndrome? Basically that they're not imposters. Um, that's what, that's what it comes down to. That's why they wrote, Oh, we're not, I don't know. I only skim the internet. I hate it. I only, uh, I only skim articles. I mean, that's fine. Did you get the gist? Do you think? I think I just got the gist. So I don't really have anything. Um, I don't even have anything specific to say about any things I read lately. It is funny. I saw two things pop up lately about it. So that's funny. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's just these people saying, Hey, I should buck up and like be okay with the knowledge that I do have in providing it. Um, and they, and why was this worthy of a blog post? Um, I don't know, man. There's people write stuff all the time. I feel like the, (laughs) I think the level of uh, worthiness, is uh i feel like the barrier to entry is pretty low that's the problem the the problem is becoming i think the internet's been incredible at linking people that would have never met each other in any way 20 years ago and building communities and increasing knowledge but because the barrier of entry is so low there's so much chatter and i feel like i add to it a little bit too and i I don't like it i feel like 98 percent of our sentences are meaningless but they are damn entertaining. Is, <laughs> are they? That people tell me. People tell me that we're so entertaining. People told you you're not an imposter. And you feel good about not it. An, not a podcast imposter. So there's something else, right? And okay. I will have to Google it. And it's, uh, it basically says that uh, there's people out there who think they're experts, but they um, essentially do not possess the I guess the amount of self-awareness or maybe it's intelligence or some combination of the two to realize how much they don't know that's way mo- there's way more of those than there are imposters or uh, people with imposter syndrome I feel like maybe like saying you have imposter syndrome maybe it's like a, it's like a little bit of a humble brag maybe <laughs> you know what I'm saying yeah <laughs> Because the definition of imposter syndrome is you do know what you're talking about. Yeah. and they, But you don't want to say you know what you're talking about. It's, and I have imposter syndrome. You are. Guys, I have so a you confession. Are, you are an imposter. I have an imposter syndrome. Um, I have so much to tell you that's so important. And I just really don't have the confidence to put it out. I don't know why I sound like a surfer when I'm doing that. Let's get on to this other thing that I don't know the name of that we'll uh, maybe yeah. we'll, we'll put it in the YouTube notes. We're there. We're yeah. there. Go ahead. Because you know what? I mean, I don't think it's whatever. It is what it is if you say you have imposter syndrome. We, at least we know about it now. We know it's a thing. Thanks. Thanks for putting um, it out, guys. I don't, I don't want to hate on these people. We're just here to talk. I think it's dumb. I'm not hating on it. I just think it's dumb. So, yeah, I think the internet is filled with people who again, do not have the self-awareness to realize how little they don't know. There's way more of that than there is the opposite. I mean, I, at certain points, I I try not to overextend my reach in terms of what I do and don't know, but there'll be certain times, you know, I think, I think I've got certain things figured out and, um, you know, just cause, uh, everything's working out wonderfully in my own little window of the world. 
But then, uh, you know, you run across something and it opens your eyes up dramatically. So, I mean, I see how that plays out. I mean, on a small scale. You know, it's funny because I think that whole running into something that changes your perspective, that's, to me, actually one of the points of life is to aggressively pursue as many things as you can that challenge the worldview that you hold. Speaking of how you were saying the Internet's distributed or the information is distributed, I feel like that's not po- the Internet makes a little bit of that discovery impossible because you can just become self-referential. Even in the communities or groups you decide to participate in in the internet, and you reinforce. So you're saying you're only finding information that reinforces. Right. Your, what is that confirmation bias? I don't know. Whatever it is, in, that's we don't the, know the name of anything. No, we're not scientists. Or that's what Google's for. We're intelligent in any way. Um, but no, it's true, and it seems to be. I kind of, I kind of love hate relationship, sort of with the internet. Don't we all? Because there's so many things that I've found out through the internet that I never would have ever been able to have access to. Right. Here's a humble brag. I can't do math, but I love reading about physics. And the things that I have access to in terms of like physics, I would have like how would I've ever found out about any of the things? I send you I send you links to quantum physics papers all the time and you never respond to them. Promptly ignored. Right. Immediately ignored. Don't try to get me into your weirdness. But anyway, the No, I mean I I see things that I never could see. But God, the drinking, the level of drinking on this podcast. Man, well, that is what it is. Once I finish up this Bold Rock Pear Cider, I'm going to get on my iced coffee. Maybe you'll pour me some more kombucha. Maybe, Maybe I'll throw up. Anything can happen. Yeah. Don't drink a liter of it and then shit your brains out later. I don't feel good already. No. Where, where was I saying? Oh, the um, I have access to information that's credible because the, the things I read are from major universities but the level of crap on there i guess you gotta you gotta learn you gotta create your own filter to wade through it which Which is very important but also requires again uh self-awareness self-awareness which if you do not possess is an issue what what should we do about these self unself-aware people i think you just ignore them i don't know don't you hate that the internet gives them the ability to be even more grandiose and unself-aware? Yes. Um, I mean, yes. you have a large, you have a large audience, um, potentially, and that's again, we probably talked about this, but the, uh, I mean, I feel like often the uh, the people with the least amount of quality information and uh, have the loudest voices and have figured out how to. Uh, um, speak the most effectively to a lot of people. I think that's something that's actually limited our growth in a lot of ways is we won't do a lot of what we know will get attention or will you make it a face. I'm thinking. I mean, we just won't do. Hey, you smirk sometimes. I love to smirk. Hey, we just won't do certain things, which I, people people listening are probably like, well, I don't even know what you're talking about, but it, it's the hashtagery. It's the associating with certain uh, internet, Instagram stars. It's the lowering the, it's not the barrier of entry, but I feel like the information that we do put out is quality. Yeah. And maybe that's not even our bag. Uh, what we talk about in this podcast is definitely not towing the line of like crazy. God, we were just talking about this off air flag, wag- flag waving crossfitters, or we approach all these things with a skeptical mind, which if you're not putting up on Instagram, you know, daily inspirational quotes, which are just fucking nonsense. I mean, you're, you're not on the train. Yeah. It goes back to, uh, I feel like having a certain level of authenticity and, um, knowing what is like genuine in terms of, I mean, how you want to get your voice heard. Um, which I think, uh, I don't even, I, it, it, okay. It's clearly not that hard to like, I don't know, get hooked up with some like cross a game celeb, you know, no. it doesn't take that much money. Clearly we talked about it last time. It can't yeah. take that much money. You could do it right now. I could, I could throw out names, but I won't um, people you could call right now. We, uh, I, I have a hard time with, I don't know. And there's just so much that doesn't seem particularly genuine. And I, I would even have a hard time, uh, defining what makes something genuine. Right, but I was going to ask you that. Um, I, I don't know. It's more like you, you know, when you see it kind of thing, which probably isn't great, but I look at, um, okay. What's not genuine. That's a better way to put it. 
Because that's probably a lot easier to say. I know it is. Okay, then what is genuine? I'm just saying the opposite of whatever you're saying. Um, <laughs> but I know okay. it's not so genuine. I uh, started following, you know, I, I somehow found Greg Everett and Catalyst Athletics. You, very, love, you love that man. Um, it is what it is. Love that man. Um, but I never once saw him post something that did not have the Greg Everett voice behind it. You Which know? is the voice, and I, I just, say this with all due respect, of an asshole. I like him, but he's he's a, uh, he's a curmudgeon. Curmudgeonly is exactly what I was going to say. Well, I can relate to this. Um, but also, like, I know he's not going to post a picture of, like, him high-fiving some new NPGL athlete and then, like, uh, I don't know, like, some girl's ass and abs and stuff like yeah, that. He's um, not going to put up an Insta quote. Yeah, it's... Uh, I just you know what you know he's going to put his curmudgeonly thoughts about things out there. Right. You know he's going to put out some videos and some articles and that are written by other curmudgeons. Um, and that's what that's what he's going to do. And I know how he's going to promote it. And I and there's never going to be a surprise, right? His growth has been slower though than some people's. But there's I feel like a depth there. I I agree. I mean, like sometimes I don't like him just for. Maybe the curmudgeon thing gets me upset. Plus, his I'm not, personality, his internet personality. But I mean, I'm he was just, even, he was a very nice in person. I've actually yeah, I've met him too. Um, I I can't I actually can't be mad at his personality because I feel like our personalities are similar in a lot of ways. Um, maybe it's the whole I love I like weightlifting, but I don't love weightlifting like you guys do. Um, but his growth has been slower. Do you know what I heard yesterday? What a certain extremely popular fitness and conditioning or conditioning and whatever, whatever strength conditioning Mm -hmm. podcasts. I'll just say it. I was listening to barbell shrugged and do you know what they said? Do you you know what they said? Tell me what this flew right in the face of everything we've ever done at least together. No, even separate. They said that in 2007 they wanted to start a weightlifting gym, Mm -hmm. but you're going to love this. They could tell CrossFit was going to be the next big thing, so they decided to do that. If you knew my undying love of CrossFit when I first started, and I was never a douchey flag waver, but CrossFit changed my damn life in every single way, shape, and form. And it made me, it gave me the ability to be all the good traits that I had to increase and all the bad traits that I had to uh, diminish. And to hear someone say, oh, we did it because we thought it was going to be the next big thing. I wanted to reach through the speaker and choke the person saying that. Right. Because it was like something that has given so much to me and so much to a bunch of people. They were using as a uh, as a way of marketing or business or whatever. And I can't, I'm not mad at someone for starting a business and making money. That's not what I'm saying. Because everyone accuses me of being a communist on the show. Um, but to hear that. That is to me is the essence of not being genuine. I think it depends on <laughs> whether or not your goal is to be, I mean, genuine for whatever its definition is, which we do not have, or if it's just to make money. And um, I've heard some quote that uh, again I'm sure has a source, and it's uh, we won't tell you what the source is. Uh, something to the effect of if uh, if all you want to do is make money. It's uh, nothing else in life. Then it's it's pretty easy to make all the money you want. If everything else can get thrown out the window. What does that mean? What? So I'm saying, <laughs> if you have no no concerns, right? Um, like morals and ethics. If and- you, no, no more. Yeah, exactly. No morals. No ethics. No no desire to be authentic with your information. Um, it can't be that hard to make money. And so if we're saying, you know, maybe it's like, well, they were like, well. Maybe we love weightlifting, but uh, we just want to make money, and it is what it is, and so we're going to chase this other thing, because well, it looks like the better opportunity. All right, so reverse our conversation a little bit. Greg Everett in 2007, though we had a CrossFit affiliate, was never like, well, you know what? This CrossFit thing is looking like it's going to get real big, so I'm just going to drop the weightlifting for a minute and do CrossFit, because it's way more important. That's okay. authenticity. Yeah. You don't give up what you love. You don't give up what you love for what's expedient. You don't do that. I saw him post something recently. Um, he did used to be a CrossFit affiliate for a lot of people that may not know. 
He was the original NorCal CrossFit. He was the original NorCal. Were was they the called f- NorCal CrossFit? Or CrossFit NorCal, one or the other. Yeah, you're right. And it was uh, the fourth affiliate. Okay, there you go. It was probably, he posts like 15 times a day, which mm. is crazy. Um, he's probably on that, there's a bot or whatever for that. No, he's real. He's <laughs> he's just sitting there. Jake, you're going to be crushed when you find out that he's on the bot. I have I have messaged him multiple times and he's messaged me back like 10 minutes later. That doesn't mean that his Instagram is not preloaded. He is a smart man. He was one of the first people to be like, hey, you got to treat this box like a business. I could see him using that. I'm not saying it creates posts for you, but you can preload posts in there. Maybe he is. I'm just saying you got to take the time to also preload those posts. Don't don't turn him into a savior, Jake. All I'm saying. Stay realistic. There's nothing I'm saying right now. But anyways, he made a comment. It was like, if you're getting into weightlifting because you just want to make money. You're not in it for the right reasons. Well, if you're getting into weightlifting just to make money, you're also an idiot because you're not going to make any money. That's how it's looking right now. I mean, he's making some money, I'm sure, but I don't think but he But that's, that's a long-term brand that he's built that he's making money. Years and years. Yeah, but that effort I can respect. I can't find it. It wasn't even that long. He also said recently, I'd rather be a hard worker who never wins than a winner who never works hard. How do you feel about that? I don't know. I just saw it. That's sort of a weird. Why do we, why why can't we work hard and win? Yeah, or why is someone who wins without working hard any less of a person? I don't know. Maybe it says something about their character. I feel like it's discounting the real truth of natural talent. Yeah, I think you got to work hard still. I feel like there's several football players in college that don't work hard. I last night I watched thirty for thirty with um, God, what was that guy's name? Maurice. He was a um. He played in uh, Oklahoma in the eighties. I know you don't like football, but I'm gonna tell you this anyway. And uh, he was gonna win the Heisman Trophy as a sophomore. Pretty much impossible, but he was gonna do it, or people projected him to do it. Then he came back from the summer and he was fat, and his coach hated him. That's uh, being a winner but not working hard. I'm sure he had to get less fat before he was good again. Well, he was fat and he was still good. He just ran over people. Well, Being fat really didn't do that much for him. That's a problem. What do you got there? It's nothing. What is that second part? Read that second part to me. The first part is, if making money is part of your motivation, you don't want to be a weightlifter. Okay. Paragraph number two. <laughs> if you think the sport needs to be changed somehow to be more entertaining, you're not a weightlifting fan. God, this dude could be talking to us right now. But at us in a negative sense. Yes. <laughs> That'd be real funny if he released that the uh, the day after we put ours out. How do you know he didn't see what we said? Because no one, uh, we have four listeners. No one listens to this podcast. No. I would laugh my ass off though if he is talking to us. Well, Jake, that timing is impeccable. I when know. did he put that out? Uh, I don't know, like late June. The Ooh. day after. No, it wasn't out yet. No, it'd just be funny if it was. Gosh. What were we talking about before all this? We're... Well, the one thing that keeps crossing my mind is why would someone that know talking about hard work, someone that knows a lot has put in the work to know a lot, right? Okay. How could they ever get imposter syndrome? I don't even know. What, what do you mean? Okay. Stay the question in a well, different way, please. I, I'll use my example. Um, I've gotten published nothing big, but I've gotten published, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to do this weird thing where I'm trying to build like a writer's Instagram, but it feels feels weird. I tried to encourage you down that path years ago. Yeah, whatever. I've tried to encourage you to do lots of things that happen years later. And uh, the it just feels weird. And I think a little bit of it is because I don't have yet, which might change really soon, an actual publisher, publishing house, big time, put my book out. You don't got a book deal. I don't have a book deal. So, and I feel like I'm like those people I see on the internet that are like, I'm a writer, I'm a writer. And I'm like, you're not a writer. Because cause neither of you have a book deal. Neither, but I'm better because I work super hard and I'm actually good. So you know you're better. I know I'm better. And you work harder. I'm actually getting um, a story published. What if you have that other thing, the other syndrome, we don't know what it's called. I'm just fucking with you. No, but that's okay. There you go. 
it's it's funny, but it's not funny. Shut up. Uh, I I worry that when I post things about writing, mm-hmm. I feel stupid because I get into this thing like, who am I? But I know I know what I'm talking about. And I never put anything explicit like you got to do this when you're at it. You got to do. I talk about things that have helped me become a more effective writer. Whether it's like having a morning routine, which is not my idea, I stole from everyone else. Whether it was meditating, visualization, whatever. Okay. Yeah. And um, so I sort of have imposter syndrome. You feel like you're not qualified to make these Instagram posts. The minute the minute I get a contract, I will feel very qualified. But it's funny because what has actually changed? Nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've been validated externally by an uh, industry that might or might not be disappearing. Right? It's like the paper, like the paper business. Exactly. So. Is that the book writing business? It's a book writing business. You're, uh, you're working at Dunder Mifflin right now. <laughs> it's just dying. People aren't going to read anymore. Do you get where I'm coming from with this? You're the Michael Scott of... Uh, I don't even know who Michael Scott is. It's, uh, it's Office, man. You should watch it sometimes. I just know Dwight. That's it. Dwight Schrute. And I knew what Dunder Mifflin is. Dunder Mifflin? Dunder Mifflin. Dunder? Dunder. Dunder Mifflin. My point is, how is someone who's worked hard to gain knowledge afraid of being an imposter? Is that what they're saying? That's the syndrome. But that doesn't make sense. You've put in the work. That's why it's a syndrome. That's not just it. That's why it's got a name instead of just being life. So isn't it really just a confidence issue? Isn't that what we're talking about here? I feel like it is. I mean, that sounds right. I feel like these people that wrote this were literally just trying to validate why they're they're making blog posts. So one person was local. All right, let's uh, let's let's be. I don't know. Why do we even got to talk about this anymore? Everyone else is talking about it right now. Let's talk about something cool that other people aren't talking about. All right, let's talk about something cool. What do you got? I mean, this has been cool so far. We've talked about many things. I feel like the intensity's been high in this podcast. Because you're drinking your um, your girly cider. Dude, this is crap. You're like... This is uh, absolute crap. You're basically drinking Zima over there. No, I'm drinking uh, alcoholic Kool-Aid right now. This yeah. is crap. Do not, do not get the Crispin Natural Hard Pear Cider Blackberry Pear. That's no different than a wine cooler. No, I'm drinking a I'm I'm drinking a fucking Seagrams right now. Get it together. This is uh this tastes like Kool Aid, and I like everything else Crispin does, but this is just horrible. I'm drinking it because I'm trying to loosen up the old tongue on the podcast. <laughs> Not that I need any help with that. Keeping things loose. Uh, Jake. Yes. I am um talking right now to stall while I try to think of another question to ask you. We got plenty of things to talk about. Oh, tell me more about that book you read. What book did I read? You read the the marketing book. Oh, um, it was terrible. That's fine, but you got something from it, obviously. All right, I read a. Uh, well, I think it was meant to be terrible. I, I was meant to hate Who it so much. Who writes a book that's meant to be terrible? Because they want it to be talked about on a podcast. All right, here it's we go. Bad. Let's give it to them. Well, I think it's getting back to how information is distributed. The um, book, it was something from the biz, which uh, I think a lot of uh, CrossFit affiliate owners are going to be familiar with, um, John yeah. Birch. And um, What did he used to own? Uh, he didn't own anything that I know of. I mean, nothing that we would. Like, he was what you have tied in with there? CrossFit LA. You know, I don't have to talk monotone. It's a podcast. Like, this is... Our well, voice is the most interesting part of this whole this thing. This is funny that you... Anyway. Welcome back. <laughs> Halfway through the podcast. John Birch. John Birch. The John Birch Society is a right-wing separatist group, by the way. Well, maybe he's... Maybe he's the leader of it. Uh, yeah. He's got a militia. <laughs> States rights. <laughs> <laughs> don't tread on me. Um, fucking communist. Yeah. Um... <laughs> So uh, I'm not a communist. What? Uh, yeah, he lists it's it's a marketing book which uh, geared towards CrossFit affiliate owners. Um, it was very interesting. The biggest thing that I, the big takeaways were that, um, and these are things we're not good at, which is I think why we have a, a bootleg podcast. And um, what are you talking about? We don't. Why we don't have a million subscribers right now? All right, here because we're not good at these things. Not good or don't believe in them. Both. Um, he calls them primal triggers 
and just basically lists things that he feels people. Is this like Maslow's hierarchy of needs? It's exactly like that. Okay. Um, people, it, things that people are going to engage with in social media, um, sort of on a subconscious level. Right. So, you know, I guess when you're, uh, you know, looking at a gym, let's say you want to like promote your gym yeah. and you're going to say, well, Hey, everyone's healthy and we got really great instructors and you're going to get a bigger snatch and we got open gym hours, you know? That's what you could say, and then no one's going to like your posts because it's not very interesting. There's nothing to engage with on an emotional level. Why well, you should you're rolling your eyes? Because I think already that I don't like this. I mean, it's true. I don't think it's. It's just funny how, like, I think it is true. The reflection of reality. Right. I hate it though, and I think it is true. God, I don't go on social media like that. It goes back to your voice. Keep going though. Is it authentic? So if okay, if you have a hot if you have a hot chick in a sports bra and basically wearing panties, mm-hmm. people are gonna like that picture. Yes, I purposely don't like those pictures, even right. if I really do like them, which I mostly do. Because you're you're selling sex and vanity. I also don't want Ashley to see that I've liked all those pictures. <laughs> even, though really, she, even though she wouldn't care, it'd be really funny. Uh, I think like the creepiest thing you can do on Instagram or Facebook is to go back like four years on some girl's uh, profile yeah. and then like a picture of like her at like a Memorial Day barbecue and a uh, swimsuit. Who did that? I uh, Did I secretly do that and don't remember? No, I know someone who did that and I saw it in Facebook. No, they're uh, damn it. in prison. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe the two are tied together. Not really. Um, and he, uh, this guy, he, he, Friended a girl on Facebook. Right. And then I see it pops up in my news feed that he likes this picture of the girl. Yeah. And it's just like her and some other girl's ass in a bikini. And like ass to the camera? I mean, it was just like they're just like laying down. You know, it's not like like on their stomachs. Something like I'm trying that. to visualize this. And someone to decide to take Looking a picture. Looking over their shoulder. Yes. I like that picture. All right. So uh he likes it. She pops up in my news feed. She got the notification, I'm sure. You know, half his friends did. You know, their mutual friends all got this notification. Right. And so I was like, well, let me click on it. And then I see it was taken in, you know, 2008. So what he had done was done the full scroll. The full creeper. Yeah. He did the full click through. He clicked through all like 293 profile pictures. There's a statute of limitations on like what you can like. I think it's like a week. I mean, I think. Yeah, at the most. Unless it's like you're real good friends and you're like, oh, I haven't seen so-and-so's thing for a while. Let me go check out what they're doing. I feel like that's like a that's like a grandma getting on social media sort of thing. Like you don't get it. Here, But here's the problem I got. How is it stalking if you put it out for the world to see? Because it's not. Mm-hmm. It's just... It, it, it feels like it, time has passed because time and physical time has passed, but it's all frozen right there. So if I'm friends with you through a friend request or a follow request, however the case may be, and I go and look at all your things, why am I a stalker when you put it on there? That's not stalking. There is this expectation of social media that it's a very immediate um, sort of transient thing. Like it's just, it is the now. That, that is, is all there is. Th- that doesn't even make sense. It's not like I'm like crawling up to your window and looking inside, you know, at 930 at night. But you are doing the social media when equivalent. That is not the... the so already I have more, that's a beef with me and social media. How about media. this? It's like, let's say you go to visit a good friend's house, right? Right. And you're talking with them. You you see them now as they want to be seen at that moment in time. Yeah. And they go to the bathroom, right? <laughs> okay. You're alone in the house. Right. You start digging through their photo albums. That, no, they didn't. Is their photo album pasted on the wall? Maybe it's just like in a corner, you know? Maybe here's, it's accessible, but not in the forefront. Okay, here's the equivalent. They have framed pictures am i not allowed to go around and look at them when i'm in their house while they're taking a dump in the bathroom i feel like that's more like the uh your what's the the background like the the, the picture at the top of your facebook account uh, what is that called yeah your background i'm stretching this analogy come on but i love it no you yeah you can only go a week back that is most i don't that doesn't make sense oh, i know it just it's the rules man well, I, I didn't make them. I've never liked the rules. All like, right, so John Birch Society. Um, 
All right. So listen to other things like that, but it's, uh, I mean, not just sex and vanity. It's like, um, you know, certain feelings of inclusion, you know, you see, uh, two people high fiving and you're like, I want to be friends with those people. I want to be friends with those people. Or How I do I get want in? friends? Uh, yeah. I bet you a lot of people join the gym just cause they want friends. There's nothing wrong with that. There, no, that's a good, that's a decent reason to join a gym. It's not like no one joins gold to make friends. No. Um, exclusion. Feel like you're missing out on something. That is an old marketing principle. And whether it means that you're, uh, you don't get to be a part of that group of friends, or maybe it's just that there's only three spots left in your upcoming seminar. That's a big thing. I try to do that, but it doesn't ever work with our stuff. I'm like, oh, the spots are limited. No one cares. But yeah. that's an old marketing. We principle. do that with Superfit Works. I mean, but that just you got a works big, in that context. You got a big following. Bigger. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's all right. Um, and so that that I have no problem with. No, well, I was looking, and there was more. Um, Did I you mean, know marketing is based on um, propaganda or information operations? That's uh, no. Well, yeah, principles of marketing are based on principles of propaganda that were defined in the first and second world war. Very interesting, huh? I mean, it's basically the same thing. The way we manipulated people to betray their causes. Uh, we also manipulate them to buy shit they don't need. They're betraying their wallets. Betray your wallet, people. Hey, that is the new slogan for the gym. Betray your wallet. Get a membership. Give us all your money. So anyway. Um, but I think it's just a matter of figuring out what which of those things that you feel comfortable. Um, how how what, what triggers do you feel comfortable using to get people to want to engage with you on social media? You know the one that's going to work the most? Sex and vanity. Yeah. People want to look good. We, good. we talked about this. I told you this a while ago. I said there's this, I think that the the whole perform as as CrossFit gets bigger and bigger, and um, which there's going to be a limit to this, and there's going to have to be a transition between how people sell themselves, but as it gets bigger, the people coming in aren't going to come in for what early or mid adopters came in for, which was performance gains. They're just going to look good naked. No, no, no. That's, that's, yeah, I think. And that's going to have to be completely understandable. That's going to have to be a new thing. People aren't going to be able to post, oh, run a 5K faster and snatch more. They're going to be like, you're going to have abs. You're going to, if you're, you're going to have a nice butt. You're going to have a nice butt. You're going to have a good double bicep pose. Man, that, you got to hit that double by wherever you can. Double by. Um, the behind the back tricep thing. I don't know what it's called. You're going to get the good lat spread. Yeah, the, like wings. Wings. Look like a stingray. Condor. <laughs> Look at that wingspan on that dude. Why are we talking about just dudes? Oh, we just, well, I think it's implied that we're not just talking Ooh. about dudes. Uh, um, get that flat tummy. What was that noise? That was my dog. Uh, the dog that we've talked about on several podcasts. So you just got to feel comfortable, I think, with certain things, um, even though knowing that other things might sell and better than others. Are you comfortable with losing the business you might lose by not doing the things that might sell more? I think I've been doing it for about 10 years. So Will you ever adapt? Will you ever adapt the other things? I think it's just a matter of also how you do it, you know? Um you know, I think I'm not going to ever grab like some like stock Getty images, bikini photo and post to our page. Cause I want to be like, well, this is ridiculous. Yeah. But, um, you look foolish would look foolish. Other people try to use it. I get, I was helping Christina, my sister look for a CrossFit gym when she moves to Ohio and the CrossFit gym closest to her had stock like kettlebell swing pictures like she should not go to that gym yeah it was like uh like like 120 pound blonde swinging a kettlebell and like some like very 90s-esque like pants and sports bra 90s what do you mean i don't know it just it was she not a like, current style like rip away pants <laughs> what does that mean like uh she had like, like parachute a, pants yeah she had like parachute pants she, basically she had a jumpsuit on it was not yeah it was not what people actually wear do you remember that killer jumpsuit i had when i was 10 I don't. Well, tell me about it. It was blue and yeah. had Adidas stripes down the arms and the legs. I actually feel like it ran also from the armpit to the waist and continued onto the pants. What? what I also had a, a little, red one. What is a little kid need a, a jumpsuit like Little this? Italian kid. Think about it. We live for jumpsuits. Did you have a 
a wife beater and a gold chain underneath. <laughs> I've had a hairy chest since I was nine. Oh God. The, the, the cross, the golden cross just nestled in the wiry man fur on the child. Dark forest. Um, I, I don't like what this guy's saying. I think it's true. And I did not say I didn't think it was true. I just said I don't like it. Did you listen to that podcast I told you to listen to? No, I never do. Well, let me tell. I will eventually. Let me tell you what it said. Why not? Let me not waste your time, Jake, and tell you what it said. Time's valuable. Uh, so valuable. Um, like my time is not valuable. Well, you choose how you spend it. If I, I would do anything I could not to spend it here right now. What do you mean? This fucking podcast. You love it. Um, many CrossFit gyms are not growing. It's actually been a trend since 2013-ish. How do we know this? Um, these guys that were on, it was the Wattcast podcast. Uh, they have been involved deeply in CrossFit since the beginning. Who are they? Kenny Kane, who now owns CrossFit LA. Mm-hmm. and Which is what John Birch was tied into. He was. And Andy Petronic, that was like the second affiliate. Andy Petronic sold it. To Kenny Kane. Yep. Um, and the other guy owns CrossFit High Voltage, which was owned by someone else. The gist of the podcast was, uh, if you had the choice today, would you open a CrossFit gym or would you buy it? And given the specifics of their situation, the conversation veered heavily towards the fact that they bought CrossFit gyms from people. Hmm. And uh, how the valuation was determined, why they did this, what's going on in the CrossFit community. In California, which I, you know, CrossFit to me in California seems to be... The most popular thing with no sign of waning. But apparently that's not true. Lots of people are trying to sell gyms. Hmm. The people that they bought their gyms from in particular, they did it because they were burnt out. Like they were just, I mean, Andy Petronic was what, 10 years deep maybe? Yeah. Maybe longer. Needed other things to do. Yeah, he was just like, I want to do the next chapter. Uh, Husband and wife team owned High Voltage and they were also like, they were like, hey, we want to have kids. We want to move closer to our family and our friends. You know, this has been great, but we're ready to go. So these guys had offers from lots of other people to buy gyms. Yeah. They were getting random. I don't know if this happened to you. This is kind of what I'm bringing up. They were getting calls at their gym, not only people looking to buy it, Hmm. but also saying, I got this CrossFit gym. Do you guys already have one? Do you want to buy another one? Interesting. Right. And they talked about how valuation was determined and how a lot of evaluators can't at this point really... Because they don't understand the model of CrossFit. They don't understand maybe what certain things are worth, Mm -hmm. whether it's the community, the membership. Actually, social media has metrics on it now that can be bought and sold. Yeah. So they had to get an evaluator that had done several CrossFit gyms. Right. But talking to people, they found that um, the growth of lots of people's gyms have stagnated. CrossFit LA apparently has stagnated for lots of different reasons. Um the the level one that actually CrossFit headquarters does is apparently it's not bombing, but it's not growing like it was. There's a reversal trend. Yeah, you know if you uh, do a Google Trends search on the term CrossFit, have you ever done that before? I think I have a while ago. I feel like maybe we even talked about that. Um, and you can see that. How do you do? You go to how do you get to Google Trends? Through Google? Yeah, I mean, I just Googled trends. <laughs> and it will send me to Google Trends. Uh, I'm going to pull it up real quick. Is, But you can see it's actually flattened out quite a bit. Really? The, um, it's really not surprising. I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, everything's going to have a, a growth curve, you know? Um, so I'm not like, I mean, it's just how you respond to it, I think, and what your expectations are. Well, well that's where they went with the... Um that's where they went with the the second half of the conversation in a way. They were talking about how CrossFit was one thing. Chris Laurie actually said something that was really interesting when we did the video the, earlier this week. He was talking about how he was going to have to make his gym nicer. You know, drywall, mirrors, made a joke about a tanning bed, so on and so forth. And I said, that's nicer? And he goes, maybe in the CrossFit world. And I was like, that's funny because... You know, we've talked about this a million times. The whole austerity, the whole hardcore Spartan, all that nonsense. That used to be what it was about. But it's not about that anymore. And there's going to be a lot of gyms that have to become gourmet 
boutique gyms like redefine themselves as that so that they can capture that sort of crowd do you know what i mean absolutely i mean well i think it's uh i mean just your the unique aspect of crossfit alone is not going to be enough of a sales pitch doesn't mean anything anymore um i think the games actually hurts it too i think having those types of bodies and the, that type of ability showcased often scares more people away than the whole, oh, you're going to get injured or it's too hard thing. Yeah. Because now they see, well, that's not really something for me because I can't do that. If I was opening a CrossFit gym right now in somewhere like near Stony Point, there you go. which for those of you that don't know is a affluent area of Richmond, I would make it, damn, look at that. Hey, we're looking at the, a graph of CrossFit. Yeah, I mean, we show that basically it was non-existent in 2005, and now between 2013 and 15, we're just hitting repeating sort of peaks. But, I mean, it's not dropping. It's just going up and down, yeah. up and down. But yeah. generally in the same area for about two years now. And that's what they, they, they actually put that number on it. They said the last two years. Uh, but what I was saying was if I was opening, I would make it so boutique, boutique and, like, Gucci. Just trying to capture, which... You're laughing. You're smirking. I am. Smirking. We hate smirking. Just no, a, but like, that's not something you would do or want to do, but it might be something you have to do to go out there. Well, it depends on who you want, what you're trying to get. If you're out there. Where are we at? Oh. I yeah, would say affluent. Point. Yeah. People that go to Bikram's and are serious about it, people that go to, people that shop at the malls out there or the mall out there, like mm-hmm. they're, they, they don't want to walk in to a place where the toilets are backed up. So I would make that place, I would make it like a spa. Yeah. Our first place, uh, we moved in and they were still, they were building it out kind of. Um, it was like half built and there really wasn't any plan to build more. Yeah. So it was like a thousand square feet, had a few hundred square feet of like a little office and uh, there was like a bathroom, but they like, for some reason they just like, they installed the toilet but they didn't put walls around it. They put like half of a single wall. And so like the line, there's no line of sight, right? I've told people this, I think. Yeah, it's, it's still funny. funny. Uh, there's no line, there's no line of sight. Like if you're just training or whatever um, in the <laughs> gym, but like you could just walk around the corner and it should be like, that's watch, it. Watch someone take a dump. Um, there was a chain. There was a chain as an indicator. You would string across the, uh, the gap. But still exposed. You're completely exposed. We didn't care or know that that was not a good thing. Um, that would never fly now. No. I mean, that's... It a, didn't really fly then, but it, it is what it is. Yeah, it flew more than it fly now. I mean, is that something you, you think about, about how you're going to have to redefine what it is you do at some point? Or redefine, maybe like, uh, better word than define is like, God, what's the word I'm looking for? Magnify? It's, or it, like, it's refining, I think. It's a constant process. Refining. That's um, a better term. It's, you're going to have to make sharper what it is you believe in to attract the people that believe in the same thing. That sort of makes the assumption that we're not already like doing that. No, that's not. That's just saying like you got to be always aware. Yes. Don't you think that you're going to have to every, not every day, whenever your annual like inventory of whatever it is you're doing, are you ever going to go, okay, what are we doing now and do I still want to do that or do I want to do this in a different way? Does that make sense? I mean, we're that's going from talking about. Yes, it might be. One thing to another. Why, why is that different? We're talking about how nice your facility is to what you're doing. Well, no, no, I'm talking. Yeah, I see why you're saying that, but I'm also saying that the quality of your facility is a reflection of your mission. But again, I don't think that's going to be something like you. Well, I mean, maybe you do, but like we 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 get that. I mean, we look around like. Uh, like a month ago, I made a list of, called it our broken windows list, right? <laughs> like broken windows policing? Yes. Yes. Same idea. Same idea. I got it on the internet. Here you <laughs> Full go. Full circle. There you go. Yeah. Would, would you look at that? Would you look at that? Um, which is saying, hey, if you're in an area, it's got some broken windows, it's going to tend to, uh, people recognize it and maybe not, you know, subconsciously they're going to treat it differently. So that same, that same building is going to get a little graffiti on it. Maybe the nice people aren't going to come around. But if you fix those broken windows. Yeah, yeah the, the same people who might have tagged it are going to be like, you know what, let me, let me tag that other building that already looks a little jacked up. Right. 
So we go around the gym and just say, what are the things that aren't like in your face issues, but how can we make the facility? What's wrong with you? I'm just burping. I don't want to burp into the mic. You just look like you're like going to vomit as you did that. It was disgusting. Um, <laughs> see if we had a video version, we could see People you. could see me vomit. We could see you dry heaving as you burp. By the way, uh, Alan did Fran yesterday and he got a PR. That's wonderful. He, but he also threw up. He told me, and I said... He, he scream throws up. Did you know that? Like, scream uh, vomits. It's a, it's a full... Uh, and then an eruption of vomit from his mouth. Was he doing this in a trash can? No, he went to the bathroom. Was, but me and Case followed him in. Did you heckle him? We laughed. I kind of wanted to give him his respect because he just PR'd, so he deserved it. But now the four people that listen to this know that Alan just screams while he vomits. I said to him... You went full CrossFit. You never go full CrossFit. Well, he went full CrossFit, and he, he did better than he's ever done before. Well, there you go. What'd you look at that? Um, broken windows. I uh, You know about broken windows policing, right? Yeah, that's what we're talking about here. Okay. but we're, So you're treating your gym like a police state? That's a, what, <laughs> how do you define broken windows policing? This, this originated in, what, the 80s in New York? Yes, correct. Maybe the late seventies. What is what is broken windows policing? Same idea. They instead of, um, I guess, rounding people up on the streets, they would look for broken windows, and they would get the city to come fix them, because the idea was maybe the riffraff attracted to that sort of area wouldn't come anymore because it doesn't seem as hospitable to them. Yeah, and so I'm saying you need to have an ongoing look. It's your facility and the way you do things right. as a gym owner to simply say, uh, how, you know, maybe no one's complaining about like a certain issue in the facility. You know, there's Correct. a wall that's not painted or, you know, it just, maybe your entrance doesn't look that good, but you could fix it. And, you know, maybe it's just one of those things like it's, it changes how they, uh, again, subconsciously, interact with and think about your facility. So maybe if your place was a little nicer, a little more comfortable or just felt more professional. And I think that's really what it gets down to is how professional it feels. You know, maybe they're going to uh, be a little more comfortable, not even thinking about it, but maybe a little more apt to invite their, their wife to come do it with them or invite a coworker over, you are, know, are we equating professional to like corporate looking? I think professionalism is it's part of just saying you care and you're aware, you know, right. that you're um, conscious of uh, what your business how appears and um, all that. I don't think but corporate. Well, what does that even mean? What does that even mean? What I got to have carpet wall to wall. You got to look like a Kentucky fried chicken. But, uh, no. Why does it got to be corporate? It's just nice. It's better. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm playing devil's advocate, Jake. Well, I don't like that. I like it when people agree with everything I say. All the time. Police state. You heard it here first. I think... Um, now, where would something like that carry over to? I think all this aligns... Not aligns, but I think all this is the same thing we've been talking about this whole time. Especially with the old John Birch Society. Yeah. Like, you got to define what you want. Here's the thing. If someone's like, I'm going to be the best coach in the world, mm -hmm. right? Whatever that means. We're not going to define it. We have not defined one thing on the show. Keeping it loose. Does he care so much about his place looking incredible? You uh, not to say you don't want to. I guess, why do you make me caveat? Not to say you don't want to be a great coach. Like forget. I'm not commenting. I don't, I don't I'm just even saying. thinking about that. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're the best coach in the world if no one comes to you. True, but wouldn't that guy? Wouldn't he do a lot of other things to? I mean, all right, let me give you a scenario. I want to be the greatest coach in the world. Somehow I finagle some really high-level athlete or I develop athletes. I get lucky in the genetic pool and, and demographics, and I get some people that I turn into monsters. I'm the best coach in the world. Come train here. Do, okay. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you know what I mean? What is what is that? Is there a question? Oh, God. You just said something. Right. There was a statement. I'm trying to tell you the scenario that I'm I'm coming with Okay, here. so I got the scenario. What's the question? Does he care that much about what the lobby looks like? I'm just saying different people that focus on different things might do different stuff. I think uh, having the be being the best coach in the world doesn't mean you got a successful business. 
And there's a lot of really good coaches with not with you know maybe can't pay the bills. That's unfortunate. Um, and you think that a nice lobby is what makes the difference? It just maybe it could be part of the whole thing. It's not maybe it's not the one defining factor, you know, but it might be c- contributing. All right. So when Kenny Kane on the Walkcast podcast says that I'm not trying to get people to come in here to work out because that apparently they they track this people that were just coming to get into shape mm-hmm. when they were on the old CrossFit what he calls the CrossFit model which is you got to come in there every day and you got to go hard they were only lasting two years because they were like breaking mentally or breaking physically right and when he changed it to uh, I don't know some large percentage of his training days were skill focused uh-huh. and there was a combination of intensity in there and then they have what's called mental toughness days which I think are like the dick dragger workouts Mm -hmm. he said that he got people to now he has very little turnover and he said that's when he realized that he wasn't on the two year model he was on the mastery model which he's like that's a 30 year model I don't that number is whatever but the point is the guy he's trying to get to come in here the girl he's trying to get to come in there he wants them to stay at the gym for the rest of their as long as they have a movement practice Mm -hmm. so he accommodated that by still using functional movements, executed at high intensity. That's the definition of CrossFit, if you didn't know. Um, but he also makes it very skill based. Yeah. And so that has changed. So there's changed. always something new to work on. Correct. And they're always trying to master something. Like he has apparently this algorithm that he uses to program. Mm-hmm. And he pays very close attention to what people aren't good at. And like now he's like, oh, my people aren't good at muscle ups. So for a whole year, their skill is focused on what do we need to do to build muscle ups to get the most people to get there. Yeah. So like they literally practice muscle ups or or the combination or assistance exercises that can aid in getting a muscle up very often. And I thought that was interesting because he says that's how he that's from buying it at CrossFit LA from Andy Petronic. To what he's going to do now, he says, my business model changes because of that. And I was like, well, well, why and how? Not why, but like, okay, how does your business model change? That's why I'm throwing out like a scenario of, you know, I live in a very upscale boutique section or whatever. Oh, God. Those seem different. Um, one, I well, I think that's an old idea that he is using and that is actually born out of CrossFit LA. Yes. Um, because I think it's the original idea too. They call it uh, a school of fitness, and um, I know that because I did the whole biz thing for a good while. So what if your gym was called the whorehouse of fitness. What would that mean? Use your imagination. You can try as many things as you like. Have a taste of it all. What you want when you want it. I hope someone has listened to this far because that was the funniest thing I've said so far. In the entire podcast series or this episode? No, just this episode. Don't worry, there's gyms scattered everywhere. So, School of Fitness, LA. Yeah. So, uh, it's interesting. I was looking recently at, uh, I was trying to say, like, well, how do we improve our retention? Because it's always, I mean, you uh, when you're looking at getting the gym growing, you look at uh, how many people are you coming in um, for, say, how many prospects do you have? How many of those prospects are you converting? And then how many of your members are you keeping? Right. Um, and I was just doing a little brainstorming, you know, no hard data, but I was saying, well, what are the concerns of someone in their first three months of CrossFit? Yeah. Like what, uh, what makes them stay? What makes them leave? And we should I, make a survey for this. And I way. was, uh, I looked at, well, do you think someone could even answer that truthfully? Because they're going to say, uh, I was too... I was too busy. I uh, didn't have, you know, didn't want to spend the money. Maybe we should survey ex- all existing members and then have in- newcomers. Dude, an exit interview. When uh, people don't want to. I have an exit interview. Really? Yeah. Do, are any of these questions on there? I don't ever look at it. Did, I don't even want to know. <laughs> That's your data. Anyway, keep going. You should um, look at that exit. You should put these questions on there. I'll check it out. Um, but uh, I looked at like, I was trying to just brainstorm. I was like, okay, first three months then three months to a year and a half, then like a year and a half plus and saying like, what is, what are the things that are going to make people stay? And I think that move mastery, not something I thought about directly, but, um, cause I was looking at more like, well, 
as people get on in their like CrossFit career, it is like sort of uh, achieving certain goals becomes more difficult. We've talked about this plenty of times. Yeah. So it's like becomes a bigger challenge, but also I think much more rewarding, you know, uh, you know, Justin Williams, eight years into CrossFit set a 50 pound squat PR yeah. out of nowhere. So that's a, uh, you know, that's a big deal from he can ride that high for like a year and a half now. For like sure. he doesn't need to set another PR for this decade. If that dude slept and ate right, he would be an incredible crossfitter. Well, we're all getting old now. So Jake turned 30 yesterday. So, so now, I, now he's old guys. One foot in the grave. God, he's ready to go too. trust me. I'm just <laughs> counting down the days. <laughs> Um, so no, I think that's, uh, that's an important consideration. And, uh, and I think, yeah, people aren't really just coming in to like get their asses kicked, you know? Yeah. I, um, we, we ditched the whiteboard a while ago. Um, and we have just like computer screens. And so people can go put in their stuff if they want or not. I had someone at the gym, um, oh, don't touch my foot. You touched um, my foot actually. Someone at the gym suggested they were like well what i hate this week is people who still say time even though there's no <laughs> even though there's no one to collect the time <laughs> so really it's like just like um so i'm not saying that's how i feel but it's sort of uh it is funny things have changed like the um and for some people really like that you know some people like that it's not just like what's my time what's my time it's more like um it's just part of the whole package right um, I think you probably prevented a lot of injuries by doing that. I mean, people still, okay. So we, we did Fran this week. We did, haven't done it in like, I don't know, several months. Um, lots of PRs, which is very cool. And, uh, that's when people want, that's when we want to know time. All right. That's our benchmark. Yeah. That's cool. Um, the same people who really, really cared about their Fran time, um, like Alan, I'm sure he like, uh, he, he doesn't look at the clock 80% of the time. Right. On like just regular days. Yeah. Um, it's just the culture has changed. Um, that's interesting. Cause that's what Kenny Kane basically says. Like they have, they have days like that where it's like, don't worry about what the clock says, just yeah. move through this thing. We say that sometimes. I mean, like I will definitely, depending on the workout is, um, I'll definitely tell people not to, I mean, you want to maintain this high level of intensity, that's but it's funny cause uh, Jamie tells me to go as hard as I can on every single thing. He should sometimes, maybe that's what you need. Maybe that's what I need. And he's being a good coach. Maybe you're just, just dragging through the mud. Just, just, just being the worst, just being the worst. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, no, things have changed and, but people are also the best they've ever been. So it is what it is. I feel like that tailed off. You had a greater point than that. What that we are not tracking times and putting so much focus. So on. So you've intensity. organically evolved towards that sort of model. Well, you know, we just a whiteboard. I mean, I mean, that was a bigger, I mean, I just figured that people would still, like initially we just try to keep putting in times for people and then we just stopped. And so there's less focus on the times now. Right. Good and bad things. I mean, I, I think it is healthier in some ways to not focus on the time every, every time you're in the gym, but at the same time, you can be a little less, uh, a little less goal oriented maybe. Um, for you know, sure. In the short term. Yeah. At a certain point when we were programming, this was a long time ago, um, I would even make sure that we repeated just normal workouts, you know, like, so whatever rando workout that I program on a Thursday, that's not a benchmark, doesn't have a name. I might used to very, very long time ago, put that in two months down the road Yeah, and try to track and see if people got better. Right. Uh, we don't really do that anymore. Why? Um, I mean, I don't think you have to, I guess. I, I, I don't think you have to track those little things. Um, and it's just nice to have the variety. Yeah. I know the whole repeatable, measurable, observable, What I probably said those in the wrong order, of aspect of CrossFit's important. But it's almost like if you build, if you build progress into the program, if you build skill progression into the program, other than benchmarks, there's like not a real point to track every single freaking thing. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, so what I try to tell people, again, I think we were talking about this episode one, is like find just something specific to work on that you want to do and uh, get better at it. And that's a, a great way to find progress in the short term and have, you know, set some goals. But uh, at the same time, the person who is not interested in setting goals um, or is, is going to feel very just 
adrift, you know, they're not going to even know that they're getting better. If they're not tracking their times, they're not yelling time at the end of the workout. <laughs> time. Um, I mean, I'll talk to some people who just don't even know they're getting better, especially even like short term. So that's the downside. But okay. Do they even care or do they just want to move? They should care. I, I, got, I know why you say that and I don't disagree personally, but like on a bigger scheme, I'm like, you know what? If they just move and that's all they care about. That's not going to keep them in the gym. Have you found that those people, they, they check out at some point? Yeah, definitely. Okay. The so there's not, there's no guy. Okay. The guy that wants to look good naked, mm-hmm. right? He doesn't care what he gets on a workout. All right. I think you start, I think, you know, people will start at the, the look good naked thing yeah. and it's, you know, maybe just stays around. But I think, uh, that is a very hard thing to, uh, uh, that's a hard goal to like sort of, uh, quantify. No, it's not. Um, you just take off your clothes. Yeah. But over a long time, like what if you just look good enough naked and then you're like, well, peace out. No, because you look good naked cause you did CrossFit. Um, so I got to keep doing this to keep looking that's just like not gonna, I don't, I think very few people is that keep them. If I had a six run. pack from as much CrossFit as I did, I would never not do anything other than CrossFit. I think you also got to eat good. I'd tr- try. I'm not talking about <laughs> you. There's a, what is there, bags of Doritos? Like, right <laughs> just laying here. around. <laughs> like, you've been eating bugles. Like, Nabisco needed their bags back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just a total fraud. Bugles. Um, It's measurable. You take off your clothes. You look great. Yeah, but, okay, I just don't think, very few people, is that going to carry them for eight years? I would, I think going, going full circle, don't say that on this podcast. We can say it. Taking it back to the beginning or back to the middle. You underestimate how vain people are. They are that vain and that's, that's human. Jake, they're vain. I just, okay. How about this? Over eight years, I do not know anyone who is, that is the sole reason that they have stayed in the gym for eight years. I off air, I'll name some names for you that I'm pretty sure, but we won't say that here. Because the gym. The, anyone, I don't know if anybody who, that might just be part of the whole thing, but I don't know if anyone who was like, they got to where they wanted to be and stayed there and that's why they kept coming. And were not simultaneously concerned about their back squat PRs. Yeah. Or their you, clean and I'm not 100% not discounting that that happens. But I think, and this might just go back to like what you're interested in, what makes you feel authentic and genuine. Like a lot of people just want to look incredible naked. Just oh, there's probably a better way to do greased it. Greased and oiled and just beautiful and shining and bronzy. But you could also track um, as part of that whole thing your lifts and your skills and your times, and you can measure those over. Weeks I'm on. I'm on that train. And months. I'm on that train. In years. I'm on that train. I don't progress very much anymore, but I'm on that train. That's your own fault. It's not my... How is it my fault? I just wanted to say something to make you mad. Charlie Deardor thought he was going to beat me in a workout, and um, he didn't. And he was like, whoa, you know. And I'm like, bro, you have no idea what I have inside of me. <laughs> like, it's going to come out no matter what the outer shell is looking like. Charlie Dealer Deardor also uh, challenges locals to push-up contests in public. Does he ever win? I hope he does. He represents the gym. Hard and I like him for that thoroughly. I like him for other reasons, but that's one. Th- that's one good plus. Um, beyond that, so what? When I was getting back to the retention thing, well, the first thing I was thinking was, well, someone who's been coming for a month or two, they need to go ahead and establish some goals. They might not know what their goals should be. Yeah. Okay, their their first goal should be. It could very well be look good naked. Right? Do, do you remember those standards? Oh yeah, the, uh, the CrossFit level four. Yeah, yeah. You should hand that out to people when they come in, or like your version make of it. I'll make a big poster or something. Your it. version, be like, hey, I know you don't know what you want to do yet, but this is what you want to do. Um, I mean, it's very basic stuff. But do you know how? Like, okay, we also talk about how. All right, all over the place here, but um, primal triggers and stuff like that. And I was looking through our posts and thing, seeing what was our most successful post, maybe what primal triggers that we used. And uh, a girl getting her first pull-up or doing an awesome push-up for the first time, some of the most uh, interacted with posts that we have. Right. People engage with that. Meaning like what, likes and comments? Mm-hmm. Okay. And so I think that is very telling in terms of what people are looking for. What do you think they're looking for? 
Um, I mean, I think uh, for a lot of people, I mean, there's, of course, that sense of accomplishment and whatnot. Um, the fact that we are showing these people off is, uh, I think, showing a certain amount of inclusion, especially showing women and whatnot. It's like, hey, this is like, it's cool for you to come to this gym that's, you know, whatever, hardcore or whatnot. Um, but uh, I think people, again, just like the fact that they're represented within the community and the community supports them. Yeah. But um, there's, yeah, I, mean, I think that sense of accomplishment, empowerment may, may even the, be the better one. I think empowerment's it. Your, your way to uh, set a goal, achieve it. You are now physically stronger. You're able to do things that you cannot do. It's kind of a good thing to be able to say you can pull yourself up onto something or push up off the ground. Like you're just saying you have a little more control of the physical realm than you did before. Right. You're not, you're not, you're the hammer now, not the nail anymore. That's different than like a 50 pound back squat's cool, especially when it goes from 405 to 455. But to go from not being able to push yourself up off the floor to doing that, you're, that that's important. You're giving people capability. Capability. Man, that could be, that could be it. That, not, that's a horrible way to put it. Not a horrible way to put it. It's really clinical. But like, hey, how do we, how do we send the message that we will increase your capability? You will be a more capable person after you're done here. Well, and I think, but the capability was, is, is was what's happening. But I think the emotional aspect of it is confidence. Empowerment. And, yeah. Same difference, Constant Jake. in your daily life. One doesn't half another. I'm not is that dis- what people say? I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. Well, that's, I mean, that's actually, God, now you got a, now you got a thing that you can focus on. I said that to somebody like, uh, I had a... Said what? Half dozen of another? No. What is that phrase? Confidence empowerment angle to a, I had a personal training client that worked for a local branding agency. Yeah. And he was just telling about like what he does with people. And he asked me like the question, like, well, what are, I don't know, what do you give people or something or what is, you know, whatever, what is your product? Your product isn't uh, fitness and exercise. What is your product? That's what I said. And was he just really impressed by your I'm genius? Like, yeah, that's you know, the smartest person I've ever met. And he was like, God, do you want to be president of the United do, States? Do you want to be my boss? Do you, do you want to own my company? That's what he said to me. All right. Um, I'm glad. You, hey. In the presence of just incredible genius right it now. It is what it is. Uh, no, it's, you know what? I feel like if every choice you make on social media and in messaging, marketing, whatever, is a variant of that idea. Yeah. That's not a terrible thing. will probably thing. freaking work out. Yeah. Well, it's coming coming back around. Do okay. Hold on. Demographically, do women have more disposable income, especially in this area? I have no idea. That's something we should look into. Cause don't, don't, there don't, you go. Don't want to make seventy five cents on the dollar or something. Yeah. <sighs> now I feel like an idiot. You're, I don't I'm know. Sexist. I'm just asking. I don't know. Maybe that's maybe that's bad data. No, I think it's you're a true. communist, so you probably in, <laughs> you're probably into stuff like that. We should look at the quality. We should look at the mean <laughs> income of women. Or some variant of that in mm-hmm. uh, this area. All right, what were you going to say? Full circle. Coming all the way around. Come on, yeah, well, you interrupted me, and now I, I had the, the grand... The grand closure. The grand closing. closure Damn is it. now... Damn it. It's ruined. Um, yeah. He has it, folks. No, it's on the tip of my tongue. Now there's so much, uh, so much pressure now. Okay. I'm just saying, so... Again, it's looking at what of these aspects, uh, what are these primal triggers that we feel comfortable with? And I could tell very clearly that um, something like the girl doing her first push up is something that we should be doing right. for people. Like that's that's authentic to us. We're still selling something, you know. We're like, uh, but it's something we feel comfortable selling. And because uh, not everything's for sale. Apparently, sex and vanity are not at CrossFit RVA. Yes. And uh, full circle, God, stop taking it all the way back. If we empower people, they'll never feel like imposters. <laughs> Are there any other points we can uh, tie together with like a neat sentence? I like that one. That was a great. It's true. <laughs> Look at that dog's afoot. What's wrong with that thing? Um, That's it, Jake. All right, guys, until next week, it's just exercise. Okay.